Good morning. You guys hear me? I can hear you. Okay. This thing, I love technology. It's so good when it works. <laughs> Let me see. How you doing, Kristen? Good. How are you? Good. I am going to unmute everybody. If you want to mute yourself, just mute yourself. That way. We've got that. I want to make sure this is recording. It says recording. On my okay. End, All right. I... Good. Good. Okay. All right. So I'm going to try and just get my uh, computers acting up just a little bit here, which is not unusual for me. I'm going to try and get to open up a contract so everybody could see it. Okay. All right, let's see. Just let me know if you could see what I'm doing here, okay? Sure. You Is it showing see. that I'm loading app files? No. 
No, I just see like it looks like a table with a cord or something like that. Okay, so you're saying, all right, I know what I have to do. Let me just, I'm going to get in here and I'll see if I can change it. Okay. I want to see if I could share my screen. That's going to be the, or, if not, we could always just go on and pull one up too. Share screen, hold on. There we go, there we go. Should work. Okay, can everybody yep. see that now? Yeah. All right. I don't know if anybody else is trying to get into this, but we'll see. It's recording so they can get in. All right. So I'm just going to try and gloss over some of the, um, the minor stuff, but touching specifically on, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on everything. Um, but I do want to, uh go over like the really the most important things so just for what it's worth I will just reiterate, like if you fill this out, you know, I don't know if everybody's using that file so it's full as I, I assume most people are, but if you do fill this, fill this out, it will auto populate for you in the appropriate spots. Okay, so the, just so everybody knows, the only real difference between the as is contract and the uh, non as is contract is the inspection clauses, right? That that's the only thing that is even remotely different. So. Uh, a couple things to just take note on this, this top portion here, right? You cannot put, if you put owner of record or you get a contract that says owner of record in either one of those first two lines, it is not a binding contract. So it's, you know, sometimes there are individuals that will not have their names in public record, most notably would be law enforcement. So when you're writing a contract on those, you do need to get the party's information from the, the other agent. Just, just a little note there. Owner of record is not a binding contract. Um, obviously, as much of this information as you can put in, you want to put in, uh, especially the legal description. If it's too lengthy of a legal description, because that will, will happen from time to time, you could put in there, see uh, notes, the notes section and that, and, and just type it in there, or you could put in an attachment. Uh, it was certainly acceptable either way. If anything other than attached items, right again, so when you see personal property, anything that is physically built in and or attached, is per is presumed to be being conveyed so light fixtures uh uh appliances um uh window treatments things like that are all presumed to be 
being conveyed to the new owner unless specifically discussed and removed at which point right you're then going to put it in the items that are excluded okay um the one thing that i always like to note in this section here is just that the like if, if a buyer wants furniture of any kind patio furniture electronic devices anything like that it's really really important that you if you list them that you list them that they're going to be left as a convenience to the seller and no value is being associated with those items if there is a sale of chattel same items you know they're buying the electronics they're buying the furniture anything like that the recommendation that i make is that you create a separate addendum that is not a part of the purchase contract and you do that let the parties do that between themselves the reason for that is is really this when you include chattel in the trans the body of the contract furniture electronics you are then placing an undue burden on the uh, appraiser to place a value on those items and if a lender puts sees shadow as part of a contract they're going to demand a value to be put on those items so it does create a layer of complication that in my opinion is better left out of it and frankly i i always recommend you don't get in the middle of it i mean i recommend that you get through whenever as it comes to those items my recommendation is that you wait till your negotiations are complete you wait till your inspections are complete and then you sort of bring that stuff into the equation because if not sure enough it's going to become part of the negotiation and you know look, we have a hard enough time valuing things as it is and i will tell you that homeowners uh look at their personal property and they you know they know what they paid for it um and you know in some cases it could be very expensive to purchase up front but pre-owned anything furniture electronics anything is worth pennies on the dollar so it certainly becomes uh other than it being a convenience which is really all it is it can become bone of contention so i just throw that little sidebar in but more importantly just please know that you want to be able to uh list those things accordingly there this next section section two with the purchase price all right to me that is it's critical that you fill this out correctly you know and what's correctly obviously whatever your sale price or your offer price is going to be all right if you are i'm going you're i'm going to come back to this but the escrow deposit line there right your uh if there's an additional deposit made there you know and i always think that an initial deposit and more money after the inspection period um the amount they're going to be financing this can be done in either an exact amount or in a percentage of loan to value either one is acceptable okay and balance to close and please note it's very clear here and sometimes it's worth mentioning to the client especially if you're working with a first time home buyer or a newer home buyer that it excludes closing costs this is just the math on the house so hundred thousand dollar sale price thousand dollars down nine thousand dollars uh you know additional and then a ninety thousand dollar loan um or ten percent and ninety thousand dollar loan the reason why this is so absolutely critical in here is this is what is obligating the buyer during their finance contingency which we'll cover that when we get to that in the contract but this is exactly what the buyer is obligated to nothing more nothing less 
If you put down a 90% loan to value and a buyer wants to put down an additional 20%, they can do that. They're obligated to put down 10%. If they are, if they are uh, basically uh, notifying the seller that they're doing a 90% loan to value and the appraisal doesn't come in and it becomes a 95% loan to value and the lender can still do the deal, the buyer's not obligated to do that. So this portion of the contract and the way it's written is so very important in my opinion. And I think it's it's often overlooked on why, other than obviously you're telling the, the seller or the seller is looking at, because you have to know this from both perspectives when you're looking at this so you explain it to your seller correctly as well. You know, most cases it's just about that first number and it's so much more than that, right? Um, going back to that initial deposit so very critical here um if you write in a line there and you say hey i'm getting five thousand dollars in escrow right and you don't have in here you got to check this line a company's offer or within x right if you put a company's offer you have got to have received that money so even if it's being held by a title company Okay, um, let's just say there that it's a it's a, re, a, a, a Remax Elite Realty offer. Alliance Title has agreed to hold the escrow. Um, even if it's that case, five thousand dollars to Alliance Title. If it says a company's offer, you got to have a check in hand that says Alliance Title five thousand dollars. Other than that, you have to check the check. This is to be made within. It's the only way the contract's valid. And sometimes that's a mistake that's made. And and oh, by the way, you know, because I've heard over time the the um, situations that agents are put into where you know it's to be made within 72 hours of the effective contract, and it's going to be a wire, but the set the buyer didn't get the information from the title company, so they missed it, right? It, it, it is really your responsibility to make sure this is facilitated. You know, I, I happen to respectfully, and, and listen, if you disagree with me, I'm okay with it. I, but I happen to respectfully believe that your best practice would be to assume that no one else in the transaction is going to do the job properly. So it all falls on your shoulder. No matter what, when you look at that closing statement, and it's only in very rare cases that the agent isn't getting the greatest amount of compensation in the transaction. I find it somewhat shocking when an agent doesn't really kind of take that to heart and, and really implement strategies and procedures that protects their investment in time and protects their income. So I really do encourage you to put those things in place and you know, listen, if it's a Sunday afternoon and you're writing it and it becomes effective on a Sunday, I would I would do two things. I would do one thing and I would not do another thing. I would make sure I'm on the phone with the title company. I would make sure they're sending out the wire information. And then immediately I'd make sure your buyer has the wire information. Conversely, if you're a seller's agent, I'd be making sure that the buyer's agent was in touch with them that very next day and getting the wire information and they got it out. So I would be making sure through, through very diligent follow-up that this has been done. And if there's additional escrow monies, same practice. Reminders, follow-up, double check. The one thing I would not do, and please do not do, is please do not you be personally responsible for delivering the wire instructions to any party. That is whoever the recipient, the title company who's agreeing to do that. That's whose job it is. And if you were to facilitate handing out that wire information and that money did not get to the title company and some type of fraud activity took place, which is a huge problem in our world right now, you would be responsible for that. So, you know, again, good practices and good things to avoid. Any questions on that section two? No. Nope. Okay. Section three, uh, time for acceptance. Um, this is how long you're giving a seller, your buyer is giving a seller to 
review and make a decision to either accept, reject, or counter offer, right? Um, please put something in there. Uh, in some cases, the seller's agent is dictating what that might be. Um, if they're not, I just don't understand why more than 24 hours is reasonable, personally. Um, you, you know, with electronic communications, text messaging, you know, unless somebody clearly is on vacation and out of range on a cruise ship, there's no reason other than they're going to use your offer to try and work it against you. that you would need more than 24 hours. So again, you've got to, uh, that's just a suggestion, that's up to you. Closing date and time, always like to use the, the term on or before, right? Um, because if you can move a closing up, why would you not want to have that option? I guess is that simple. Um, doesn't obligate anybody to close earlier, but it certainly gives you the option. If you put a finite closing date in there, again, uh, that's your closing date. One thing I stress here to everybody that has become more prevalent uh, over the last couple of years, even before this most recent kind of surge in business, is that I think there's always a misconception and then it gets turned into a, an abuse where parties and I would say specifically lenders, secondly, title companies, then the agents themselves think that, hey, if I need an extension, it's automatic, I'm gonna get it. Very bad practice. The closing date is the closing date. I mean, that's the date that everybody's obligated to. If you're not gonna close on the closing date, you need the agreement of all the parties. And if you're asking for an amendment of any kind in the contract, in this situation, we're talking about the closing date, you know, it's not unreasonable for a seller to ask for something in consideration of the closing date being moved. Whether it be a financial change of situation, more money's down, whatever it might be. And I think it's very important to realize and to have that conversation with a potential party that might be asking for an extension of the closing date. On the other side of the equation, it's not reasonable for a seller. And I think you have to stress to the seller that that's the date you need to be vacated before closing. Not three hours after closing, right? Not midnight of the day of closing, because we're gonna get into occupancy and possession It all ties in occupancy and possession is when all the parties have signed right at the title company and the monies are in hand now we did touch on this uh during the other uh, during the meeting last week but i will reiterate this right it is the buyer's responsibility to get the money to the title company it is not the buyer's responsibility to make sure that the title company has gotten the money into the, the seller's hand. So closing in possession takes place on the closing date. And if the buyer has wired the funds into the title company and the buyer's lender, if applicable, has wired the funds into the title company, that deal's closed. Buyer gets possession. Hey, Tony. It's, yes. Can I ask you something about that? Sure. So my last deal, um, the wire, it was on Monday morning, the closing, the buyer had already signed. Um, the wire was in, cause I told him, you know, if you want possession Monday, it's better to do the wire Friday because sometimes if you do it Friday afternoon, it can take a bit. So he had, you know, done the wire Friday, the title company received it. And then we did the walkthrough on Monday morning and the sellers weren't signing until 9.30 that morning. And they said, and which is what we did, but now it seems like maybe we could, I could have just given them the keys. They said, don't give them the keys um, until I've let you know that everything has been, you know, closed and funded. Um, so 
Well, who know. said that? The title company. Well, closed and funded, yeah. I mean, so closed and funded means that they've received the money from the lender and the buyer. Well, they had received it on Friday. Was it a cash deal? Yeah. yeah. That's closed. Yeah. So we stood around and waited for her to say, okay, everything's done on our end. And really, I could have just given in the yeah, keys. Yeah, it's not, I, I, I would, I would look, look it, it, it's, I could have I could have Diana and I just use that as an example. I could have Diana sit here and argue that point with me, but it's it, once that funds once the the buyer has met their obligation, um, once the, the they have met their obligation and transmitted the money to the title company, and all the parties have signed, everybody has to have signed, right? That deal's closed. Okay. Thanks. Now, if you were waiting for the seller to go in and sign, then yes. If they're waiting for the wire to hit their account, then yes. I, I, would, I would subscribe to that theory. But if they've got receipt and all the documents are signed, that deal's closed. Buyer can't do anything else. Buyer can't pull their money back, you know? Right. So it's a logic thing to me. Mm-hmm. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Okay. So yeah, so we are a closing possession state. That it, it just boils down to that simple. When all the parties have signed, when the monies are in the title company, that deal is complete. There's nothing else anybody can do. Can't cancel it. There's no right of rescission. There's no if 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 a seller is asking to stay in a property post closing, uh oh. Everybody still got me? Yep. Hello? Yep. Okay, good. Um, all right, I just want to make sure. I had a weird message there. Um, if a seller is wanting to stay in post closing, well, then they got to do a post occupancy agreement. And you want to, you know, I'm not going to go into detail on it, but you want to hold harmless against Remax Elite Realty. You want to hold harmless for the the buyer because the, you know, everybody. It's so easy on our world, and it's certainly even easier for a for a seller of a property to think, well, it's no big deal if I stay in here a couple other extra hours and get my furniture out. Well. That's not exactly true because the minute those documents are signed, the minute those documents are signed, the new buyer, the new homeowner is the effective owner of the, con of the property. Their insurance is now in play. And if somebody were to fall and get hurt, they're liable and their insurance company could be sued. So there's a lot at risk for a post-occupancy agreement, just as there's a lot at risk for a pre-occupancy agreement. When it seems so simple to just let a, sell, a buyer put their stuff in a garage. Well, what if the house burns down, right? What if there's a burglary? What if the property that's in the garage gets damaged by something? These are things that, you know, look at, from our standpoint, both as a brokerage management team and my my opinion is you as the agent ceo of your company you got to think worst case scenario you cannot think kumbaya this is a binding contract everything that takes place in the scope of the transaction can have severe ramifications likely ramifications Probably not, but possible ramifications, 100%. So just keep that in mind as you walk through these. So, you know, extension of closing date, it must be agreed to by the parties, except for one thing. And that one thing, very honestly, is right here. The closing date has to be extended if the lender dropped the ball and it's for the purposes of the CFPB requirements. But even there, it can see 10 days, right? 
Again, the other thing would be a force majeure, which is an act of nature. So again, if in fact, let's say the peninsula went into a hurricane cone and therefore a buyer was unable to secure and bind the insurance policy. Well, that would be considered force majeure and the, the seller would be obligated to extend because it's not the buyer's fault. So these are the only two exceptions to all the parties having to agree to any extension. So um, occupancy on the day of, and like we just talked about, if there is a lease or any kind of agreement other than close and occupy, you know, we have to make an amendment. And in some cases, this would have to be, if, if like, the ten, like, let's just say the seller is going to become a tenant, then this would be checked and a lease would be created uh, to accompany the contract. Um, and you got to be really careful there, guys, because if you check this box and there's a mortgage involved by the buyer and it's more than just a couple of days, it could take a principal residence mortgage and turn it into an investment property and all bets are off. So again, got to be very, very, very cautious um, as to what you're, agree what you're allowing the parties agree to and the ramifications. Again, just not a simple, uh, you know, simple agreement in fact. Um, next section, the assignability section. Obviously, if a buyer is looking to assign the contract, then they got to acknowledge that. If they don't, seller's not obligated to. Now, one thing we don't see much of, but you should be cautious of, you know, you could have buyers coming in and you're not going to see it now because of the pricing. And we can go into it at a different time. But like I've seen people try and skip title and basically say, okay, I'm buying this house for $100,000 and I'm going to say I can assign the contract. And then they're trying to assign that uh, a contract for a profit. So they're selling it to somebody else for $20,000. In essence, there's zero wrong with that. They, a, a buyer can do that. An agent, on the other hand, in my humble opinion, cannot do that. A licensed agent has a moral duty and integrity to get the highest and best price for a seller. So I've had some agents that kind of do flips for a living come in and tell me they were gonna do that and looking for, some, for a brokerage to be able to do that in. And I do not allow it. Uh, I, it's just, a, it's a can of worms. But a buyer on their own can do it. A buyer can get a deal on a property and, and do it um, and sell that assignment. And but all the all the terms and conditions that are in the the prop in the contract convey you're assigning the contract, you're selling the contract. You don't see that very much. Uh, I haven't seen it very much over 21 years uh, in this business, so I don't think it's going to come up but certainly don't want to gloss over that particular clause. What does it mean? Assign so then you get into financing. And in this, I think the two biggest sections that we need to talk about, the financing clause and then the inspection clause. I really recommend that you read this contract in its entirety. But if you don't read it in its entirety, please, 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 read this section of it and check the for cash they're paying cash if they're financing you must disclose that they're financing here all right um now i am explaining this from two different perspectives right i personally think it is not a bad idea unless you know specifically what type of loan they're going through to check both conventional and FHA when they're applying for financing. It gives the buyer options. You can't them in their lender. You can't know what surprises might come up. You can't know, we just had one the other day, that over reserves wasn't approving conventional 
but was approving FHA. So if you put in here that they want to apply for both, it leaves the options open. Does that mean a seller has to agree to that? No. I, there's really no good reason why a seller wouldn't agree to that. There's no additional cost or fees. Just a thought process when you're doing it, but you have to select one of these. I suggest you select a couple. When you get into this fixed and adjustable, I mean, most times it's going to be fixed. You can't know that unless you're collaborating with the mortgage person. I suggest you do that before you write your contract. Um, and make sure like different little things that you want to make sure of. Did the, the you know, because buyers don't know the right questions to ask, right? But sometimes a borrower get a pre-approval for 200 grand and think it's okay to look at properties in an HOA or look at properties in a in a condominium complex, right? Well, those those additional fees could adjust their approval. And if you don't have that conversation up front, before you even show them properties. You could get into a confrontational situation. So, you know, a lot of what I suggest you do on your, your um, buyer's presentation, your buyer's conversation, and or your, your listing presentation, your listing conversation has to do with how an impact the contract that you might be writing or presenting impacts those conversations. I mean, it's not just about, hey, let me get your house listed. They got to understand this stuff up front so that everything that you do from that point forward becomes a collaboration and not a confrontation. Just a thought. Um, now, going back to this fixed adjustable and percentage rate, in my wildest days, I would not let a seller sign a contract that this is part of the contract because it's not the seller's, um, the seller can't control whether the buyer's getting a fixed or adjustable rate or mortgage. The, buy, the seller can't control what interest rate the buyer is getting. And if a buyer's agent puts that information in, it's causing me as a listing agent to be concerned about the buyer's viability. All I wanna care about as a buyer is can you get a mortgage? I don't care what mortgage you get. I don't care what your interest rate is. I don't care what the terms and conditions are, right? I understand that a buyer's agent might, or a buyer might want to be instructing a buyer's agent to try and put these things in as another methodology for an out in the contract. But as a seller or a seller's agent, I would be recommending not agreeing to that. And that would be a term and condition that would either funnel a contract down in my list if there were multiple offers or it would create me to reject and or counter offer a contract. So things to think about when you get into the details, right? Just those there. Then you get into all this, uh, you know, when will they make application? Well, in my opinion, again, if this doesn't read zero, there ain't no way I'd have a seller sign it. Because if this doesn't read zero, the buyer hasn't done a pre-approval. Application is made when we get six pieces of data on the lender side and we are able to, uh, to look at the, the thing and make a, uh, a judgment call as to whether or not they'll get approved. Keep in mind that just because they've made application does not mean that they supply documentation. So very important that you know that. But if they're saying they're going to make application within three or five days, then and you've got a pre-approval letter, you really don't have a pre-approval letter at all, whether it be a pre-approval or a pre-qualification. So again, I'm not saying that a buyer can't get up to I can't hear you anymore. Yeah, it's all gone. Oh, shoot. I can't hear it either. Oh, oh he's totally gone, isn't he? 
Yeah, he's like out of the meeting. What? Because when I, I was just trying to t send a note to him, but he's not even on there to send to. Hmm. This is gonna, I'm going to send him a text and say we lost him. I hope he's not just sitting there talking to the screen. <laughs> yeah. Well, it says it's still, it says it made you the host now, Lane. Yeah, I don't want to host it. <laughs> <laughs> That's weird. Because you text, though? I just sent Tony a text. I don't okay. know if he can get it. Um... I can text Dustin too, because he'll probably be. Yeah, I was just going to text him too. Yeah, for sure. Are you going to do it? Yeah. Okay. Did you have any luck with Dustin? He, this is a major text to Dustin either. What was that? I said, yeah, I texted him too, and I don't see anything either. Mm. Shoot. I can call Tony. Did anybody else call him? I did not call him. No, I did not. Okay, I'll just give him a quick call. Maybe he knows, I'm not sure, but. Okay, I just talked to him and he said, stay tuned, Dustin is working on it right now. Did you guys hear me? Yes, thank you for okay. checking on that. Okay, sure. <laughs>
Is that better, guys? Yep. I can hear you. Awesome. Here we go. All right, sorry guys, don't know. I, I have no idea what took place there. No worries. Can you guys still see the contract or no? Um, I cannot. I can't. Let me see. It. Okay. Can you guys see it? Mm, I can't see it. You can or you can't, Kristen? Um, I can't see it, but maybe it's the way I, my screen is set up. I'm just trying to. No, I can't see it either. Okay. All right, hold on. I'm going to try and blow it up. Hang on. Okay. Can you see it now or no? No. No. All right, hold on. Uh. We good? Mm, well, yeah, yeah, there it is. Yep. Okay. Sorry, guys. I, I don't know what happens there. So if we lose it, believe me, I'm going to jump right back on it. So going back over this. So we're in that, where did I was going over the finance contingency? Where did I lose you? Uh, I think you were just talking about the pre-approval. Okay. Yeah. So just going back to this. So but there's some ambiguity here, but here's the real important stuff, right? And, and you got to remember that this is baked into the contract. Buyers shall keep seller and broker fully informed about the, so, the status of buyer's mortgage loan application, loan approval, and loan prop processing, and authorizes buyer's mortgage lender and closing agents to disclose such statuses and progresses and release preliminarily and finally execute a closing disclosures and settlement statement to the seller and the broker. This is baked into the contract. It's a necessary evil that um the lender has authorization to do it but it is baked into this contract which is great upon buyer obtaining loan approval buyer shall promptly deliver written notice of such approval to the seller it is your obligation to do that if buyer is unable to obtain loan approval after the exercise of diligent effort then at any time prior to the expiration of the loan approval Buyer may provide written notice to the seller stating that the buyer has been unable to obtain loan approval and has elected to either A, waive the loan approval, in which event this contract will continue as if loan approval has been obtained, or terminate the contract. That, that number one, waive loan approval, that is very critical when you in fact have the uh the home sale contingency as part of the loan approval process you are going to have to make that determination um whether or not you want to do that um and look i think it's ambiguous here to be very honest where it says if the buyer is unable to obtain loan approval after exercise of diligent effort, then at any time prior to the expiration of loan approval, buyer may provide written notice to seller stating that the buyer has been unable to obtain the loan approval. So here's where you're at, right? That doesn't say that the lender has to provide written notice that it's term that they can't get the loan. It says that the buyer has to provide written notice. That could be in the form of an email. But where, where I can't let you lay your guard down on this term, this, this section here is all that due, due diligence and stuff, right? If a seller wants to push the envelope and request items from the lender, 
you know, they're opening up a can of worms. So in other words, what I'm saying to you, unless, although it's not explicitly written in the contract that you need to get something in writing from the seller's lender, the buyer's lender, excuse me, the buyer's lender stating that they don't have their loan approval, you really do because of all the other terminology in this contract. If the buyer fails to timely deliver either the notices or above seller, seller now gets the right to that. So I'm gonna read it as it reads. Buyer, if buyer fails to deliver written notice provided in paragraph 8B or above to seller prior to expiration of loan approval period, then the loan approval period shall be deemed waived <coughs> in which event this contract will continue as if the loan approval has been obtained provided however excuse me the seller <coughs> may elect to terminate the contract by delivering written notice to the buyer within three days after expiration of the loan approval period so very very critical that you guys make a note as to what your dates are and <coughs> tell the, the seller's agent that you've obtained a loan approval or you're giving the seller a right to cancel this contract, just so you know. If the loan approval has been obtained or deemed to have been obtained as provided above and buyer fails to close the contract then the seller, then the deposit shall be paid to the seller unless the failure to close due to the seller's default or inability to satisfy their contingency, the contract property, property related conditions of the loan approval have not been met. Appraisal of the property obtained by the buyer's lender is insufficient to meet the terms of the loan approval in which event the buyer shall be refunded the, the deposit, thereby releasing the buyer and seller from all future obligations. This is where that all comes into play where you got where I was really stressing filling out the top portion of that um, contract properly, because this is where you don't need, you don't need a, you don't need a more, a separate uh, appraisal contingency addendum when you have a finance contingency. Okay, other than, other than if a buyer's putting a lot of money down, right? And they can possibly get, a get approved even without the property appraising. So that's how that all works. Um, does anybody have any questions on the financing part? Okay. I'm just like, I'm just really zeroing in on lines 109 to 112. <laughs> And just, uh, yeah, I guess I have not noticed that part before. Yeah, it's, it's really why I stress this because I don't think a lot of, listen, I guarantee you if I put eight people, 10 people around the table and I, it was the written test, I think most people would flunk it. So you're not alone. It's just, it's just often overlooked some of the details in this contract, right? Mm -hmm. um, the closing cost fees and charges, right? It is really important. Again, this spells everything out. I'm not going to go into it line by line, but it says what cost the seller pays. It says what cost the buyer pays, right? And I think just for the record, if you are asking for a seller to pay a portion of the buyer's closing costs and or prepaids, and they are different, closing costs and prepaids are different if somebody wants to get into an argument. It's very good to write that in that other line and or put C additional terms and conditions and write it in that line. But it should be written in here if you're asking for it. Um, Do you suggest- if the, buyer was asking for the, if, if the seller was asking for the buyer to pay anything, same thing. You just want to write it in, right? If, there, if there's something additional. Like if there was an additional easement or something like that, or a uh, assessment being paid for by the buyer, good place to write it in is right there under other, right? But 
the nice thing about this contract is it doesn't leave anything to the imagination. I mean, as with any legal document, there's certainly some ambigu ambigu ambiguity and some points for argument, but I think overall it's pretty black and white and tells everybody what the, what the scoop is. So when a seller starts to argue with you about what their fees and costs are, you can refer to this because it's already spelled out. I usually put under other Title I evidence. Go ahead. I'm sorry. It's okay. I was just wondering under other, that's where I usually put like the admin fee and the amount. Is that something you suggest or no? Um, uh, let me look here. You could, it's not, I would say it's not a bad thing. Um, you could certainly put it there. I, I would make argument that you're okay either way as long as they sign a document, but if you want to disclose it there, I think it's okay. Okay, thanks. Um, that answer your question, Kristen? Yes, thank you. Okay, okay. So going back to, uh, so moving on to the title insurance, um, again, you could put as many days in here. If you get a stickler once it before that, you could write that in. I mean, I personally, <clears throat> if they got a mortgage, I write in 15 days because the title policy has to be reviewed by an underwriter. So, you know, clearly anything, you know, what I, what I like to tell, what I like to suggest to you as the agent involved in the deal, whether it's on either side, a contract is a great place to create urgency amongst the parties. Zero on your application line, five days for inspections, 15 days for title evidence. This is a really subtle way to light the fire under parties that may not be as urgent in the transaction as they need to be that are really outside your sort of discretionary advisory role and or authority. So good place to do it. Um, and then you could clearly see here, right? Uh, if you just read through it, tells you what it is, legible copy, copies, shall be obtained and delivered to the buyer if the seller has an owner's policy of title insurance covering real property. Uh, they, they should do it within five days of the effective date. Most of them don't keep it handy, don't even know where they have it. Um, and it spells it out, right? Now, what clearly it doesn't spell out in my opinion, right, is what the remedy is if they don't do it. There's no remedy in here. So, you, you know, you just got to know that it's kind of, again, kind of more keeping the parties uh, abreast of what's going on, but there's really no remedy if the, if the other party doesn't do it, to be very clear. So that's another part of that we could argue, right? Uh, this next one's pretty interesting if you haven't read it. Seller shall, and this is usually box one, seller shall designate the clo closing agent and pay for the owner's title policy and charges. Buyer shall pay the premium for the buyer's lender policy and charges for closing services related to the lender's policy endorsements and loan closing, which amounts shall be paid by the buyer to closing agent or other. So, so seller picks title company, seller pays for their fees, buyer pays for their fees. Here's the interesting one. Buyer shall designate closing agent and pay for the owner's policy and charges for closing services. Pretty wild, right? Most people have never ever looked at that. Um, but if a, you know if a buyer wants to pick the title company, there is a remedy that allows them to do that, and it saves the seller money. You could, in fact, use that if you pointed out to a listing agent, not that they would acquiesce to it. 
but you could use that as part of your negotiation that, hey, the buyer's asking for the opportunity to pick the title company, but they're paying for the buyer, the seller's closing costs and title insurance, which actually would get put more money in a, in a seller's pocket. So could you use that to your advantage in today's market where multiple offers and, and such? I think, yes, you could. I think, yes, you could if a buyer's willing to do that to try and move their position up in line in a negotiation. I think that it would be important to point it out to a seller because, you know, I know selling agents that would get their hair on the back of their necks standing up if they just asked for the right to pick the title company. And I understand why, but if they're asking for the right to pick the title company and paying for the owner's policy and paying the closing charges, they, in essence, depending on the the, the, cost, the, the the list price on the property or the agreed upon price on the property, they're, they're putting a few thousand dollars more on their offer price, which might make the difference. I was just told by an agent uh, on a million dollar property that that's how the buyer got their spot in line. They picked a title company and agreed to pay all the closing costs, including the commissions that were agreed to on the listing side up to $65,000. They won the negotiation by doing that. So subtle, but effective, right? I won't even read the Miami-Dade thing. It doesn't matter. Uh, on or before title evidence. Very critical. Read this, please. On or before title evidence deadline, buyer, buyer may at buyer's expense have real property surveyed. If a seller has a survey, they should provide a buyer within five days of the effective date. So keeping in mind that we just wrote in 15 days prior for the title. If you use that for urgency, you've got to instill some uh, urgency on the survey side with the title company as well. I will tell you that what I think is a very, very, very bad habit that a lot of title companies have got into, they're waiting to order surveys to see if a loan's going to get approved, waiting for inspection periods and all that stuff. That is completely irrelevant. Uh, and in most cases, they're asking for a buyer to provide a uh, credit card to pay for the survey. So to me, the things that should be done day one by a buyer, uh, if they are not getting a mortgage, is again, urgency on the title commitment, urgency on a survey if they want one. If they're paying cash, you got to ask that question. If they're getting a mortgage, they absolutely need a survey. So they should, you know, the, the monies that are at risk for any buyer, if they're paying cash, it's optional, right? It's definitely optional. They don't have to have a survey. They don't have to have a home inspection. That's plain and simple. Uh, if they're getting a mortgage, they don't have to have a home inspection if they don't want one. OK, but let's assume for a minute that they're going to do a home inspection. The monies that are at risk, the three to five hundred dollars for a home inspection, the three to five hundred dollars for a survey, the four to five hundred dollars or more for an appraisal. That is monies that are at risk on every transaction and you can't mitigate it. And time is of the essence when you've got a 30 and a 45 day closing. So unfortunately, that's what has to be done. And I would say, as the CEO of a company, you want to use that to your advantage because that's an investment back into the transaction by any buyer. And if I'm a seller's agent, I'm making sure the buyer's agent's doing that in earnest because other than that, to me, the party's hedging their bet, right? And if I'm a seller's agent, if you're doing a list, if you're buying one of my listings, I'm holding your feet to the fire and these are changes I'm making. So if you, you have to almost assume that as a buyer's agent when you're on that side of the equation and think ahead and explain why. Again, does it make the other, it makes the other party very savvy in business on a high dollar transaction. Does it make them evil? So keep that in mind. Home warranty, or if you're asking for one, got to specify who it is, got to specify how much it is, right? Um, Again, we mentioned this in the closing cost, special assessments, who's paying them. In most cases, the seller is, you want to check the seller is paying any special assessment in full. 
you know, that that's the one that that is most commonly used. Um, if you don't, right, then the buyer's picking up the tab after closing. So I think that's really critical in the case of selling condos and the other place it's uh, really comes in, like, you know, if a, if a, if a, uh, if a community just put in like reclaimed water, uh, the other big one is a street light assessment. This is where this is most commonly seen, you know, um, clearly here, it does make a provision if you fail to check one of the boxes, if neither box is checked, the option shall be deemed selected. Um, uh, option A is selected. And the other thing it does shall not apply to a special benefit tax lien for a CDD. So CDDs are excluded from that. So good to know. Um, this next section, pretty simple. We don't have a lot of radon gas here in this area. The only time you'd really look at that is if the house was on a, uh, like on a, uh, uh, a footing instead of a slab. If you've got a slab, you can't have radon gas penetrating in most cases. Um, you know, it's more prevalent up north in like the Tallahassee and the Panhandle uh, area, uh, mold, uh, you know, and it just clearly says that it, it, there's no obligation on the seller side here. If a buyer is concerned and desires additional information regarding mold, buyers should contact the mold uh, professional. Uh, again, has to be done within your your inspection periods. Flood elevation certificate. Um, again, got to do it right. If a buyer, if if, the, if they're being told it's in a flood zone, you know they're going to want to get a flood elevation certificate. You're going to want to do that very quickly because that's going to impact their insurance. If they're getting a mortgage, all these things become really urgent when they're getting a mortgage. That stuff, you got to light a fire. I mean, I know when they're like, I can speak for us at the go mortgage side that we create a sense of urgency in the buyer that sometimes gets stepped on by the agent who's telling them to hold off on doing things. Again, I got to reiterate here that my advice to you would be not to do that, to tell them, hey, these are the things you need to do immediately. You know, um, energy efficient brochure tells them where to get it. Um, lead based paint only applies on pre 78. If you're if you're if you're selling a home that is built prior to 1978, please use the lead based paint addendum. Um, Homeowners Association disclosure, uh, it says it right there. If, it, if it's in an HOA, they're recommending that you don't sign the contract until you get the HOA disclosure, right? If you sign the contract before getting the HOA disclosure you and, and you haven't checked that you're waiting on it or put a provision in that the contract's not effective until you execute an HOA disclosure, well, there's no out in the contract because there's an HOA. So it's very, you know, it's very critical that you understand that. Um, again, property tax disclosure tells them not to rely on it. And it's, and again, it's not your job, nor do you want to take on the responsibility to expose yourself and or your company to giving information that's outside the scope of your job. You know, if a buyer wants to do additional work, they should contact either the county uh, tax assessor themselves or they should talk to the title company who's probably going to point them to the county tax assessor. There's no way we can know where the county's going to reevaluate their taxes after they close. The, um, the current tax bill will basically convey right up until the next assessment. So you got to know that. Uh, the foreign investment thing, right? Seller shall inform buyer in writing if a seller is a foreign person. Uh, buyer and seller shall comply with FERPTA and may require seller to provide additional cash at closing. Um, it has nothing to do with the buyer. Nothing to do with the buyer whatsoever. Buyer just needs to know because I guess I, I guess if I think about it from a logic perspective, if the seller doesn't have the additional monies to put into the account that they may be owed because of FERPTA, well, then it could affect their ability to close. So you, you, from that standpoint, you got to know it, right? It's pretty clear here, you know, like I know we, we harp a little bit on sellers disclosures, but 
if you read this, the document itself is not a required document. We suggested, uh, and we, we do want it on a, on a listing, but just look at this. It's clear. Seller knows of no known facts materially affecting the value of real property, which are not readily observable and which have not been disclosed to the buyer, except as provided in the preceding sentence. Seller extends and intends no warranty and no representation of any type, either express or imply as the physical to condition or history of the property, except as disclosed in writing. Seller has received no written or verbal notice of any government entity or agency as to the currently uncorrected building environment or safety code violation. I don't think I have to really drill down on it. That's pretty plain and simple. Buyer beware, right? The seller only has an obligation to disclose what they know, all right? If they don't know their roof's leaking, they don't have to disclose it. And here's the problem, it's in a proof. Unless you know they know, if something happens after they close, you've got no remedy. It, it, it's, it, it's just the nature of the beast, right? So you look at the seller's disclosure, this paragraph to me explains what the assumption is on the part of a buyer and a seller, plain and simple. Um, this is where we get into this, right? Property maintenance during, during the contract, except for ordinary wear and tear and casual, the seller maintain the property, uh, not limited to lawn, shrubbery, pool, as, as it looks. So if you go in there and the pool's green, when you look at it, that's what the seller's obligated to do, right? Seller's not obligated to do anything but to continue to maintain the property in the manner with which you saw it. That's all they're obligated to do, unless you've agreed to something else. Um, I know that we, I know that we touched on this quite a bit uh, in the other meeting. Um, Inspection days or whatever you guys agreed to contract by the nature is 15 days. I certainly wouldn't, as a seller, wouldn't allow that. It's a right to cancel um, just by delivering notice, right? So just read it. I mean, it's pretty simple. Buyer shall during the inspection period, buyer determines and buyer's sole discretion, the property is not acceptable. Buyer may terminate the contract by delivering written notice of such election to the seller prior to the election of the inspection period, period. Doesn't say you got to provide them with a home inspection. Got, doesn't tell them you got to say why they're canceling. All you got to do is tell them you're canceling. That's it. Um, if buyer timely terminates the contract, the deposit shall be returned to the buyer. Thereupon, buyer and seller shall be released from all obligations. However, buyer shall be responsible for such payment of inspections or repair or damage to the property, restoration of the property, et cetera. Buyer can't go in and put a hole in the wall to see if it's to inspect it but then not fix it to its previous situation. Unless buyer exercises the right to terminate, granted herein, buyer accepts the physical condition of the property and any violation of the government building, environment and safety codes, restrictions, requirements, but subject to government. In other words, again, you're buying the property as is. Um, you know, the, the, the seller is not obligated to do anything but convey the property. So you do your inspections during the time frame. And then you have a walkthrough on the day prior to closing or on a closing day prior to time of closing is specified by a buyer, buyer, buyer's rep. This is, it, it spells it out here. If a seller wants to give you uh, another time to get in, that's fine. But on day prior to closing or on closing date. So you have a 10 day inspection period, a five day inspection period, a seven day inspection period, whatever it might be spelled out right there. And then on the day prior to closing, or on the closing day prior to time of closing, buyer and buyer's representative may perform a walkthrough and a follow-up walkthrough if necessary, meaning if something needs to be corrected post walkthrough. Inspection property, this is critical. Inspection of the property solely to confirm that all items of personal property on the property and verify the sellers maintain the property as required by its as is maintenance requirement and has met all contractual obligations. It's not another inspection, right? If the house is as is, it's as is. If the buy, if the seller agreed to fix things, you get receipts, you take a look at it. The one danger that I always uh, talk about in these, right? My recommendation is if possible to negotiate a amount of money for anything. If you're going to negotiate repairs, to negotiate an amount of money for those repairs versus having a seller do the repairs because 
you can't go in and say, I don't like the quality of the repair. All the seller's obligated to do is make the repair. So th there is some strategy there that I think you have to determine what you're comfortable with, with each one of your buyers. Uh, and the seller to that end, I always say to a seller, better to offer credit than do it because even though I know I'm coaching my buyer that they can't complain about the quality of the repair, sure enough, they're probably going to complain about the quality of repair. Now we got this Pandora's box that we got to deal with the day over the day before closing. Nightmare, just nightmare, right? Uh, sell, if, if, seller assistance on cooperation and close out of building. If buyer's inspection of the property identifies open or needed building permits, the buyer, the seller shall promptly deliver all plans, written documentation, or other information in the seller's possession, knowledge, or control relating to improvements to the property, which are subject to the open permits, and shall promptly cooperate in good faith with the buyer's effort, e efforts to obtain estimates and repairs or other work necessary to reserve permit issues. Seller's ob obligation to cooperate shall include seller's execution of necessary authorizations consents or other documents necessary for a buyer to conduct inspections and have estimates for such repairs or work prepared and fulfilling obligated. Seller, seller shall not, can you guys still hear me? Yes, but you're breaking up Hello? a bit. Yep, but you're breaking up a bit. We can't hear you at all now. Hey, Karen. Hello. Now I can hear you. What's going on? All right, so I don't know what he's doing back here. Oh, it's right here. What's he doing? Can we make this big? What do we do here?
per uh, per region's need. Yeah, that's what I would do. That's what I would do. That, as, I, as, I, as I kind of walk through with you, that's what I would do. Okay. This one's the only one left. Okay. Arthur, you're welcome. Oh, Saints are here. Uh, she was still sick. So we did not go to her mother. Since I worked all day Saturday, I got. Uh, why are we using guest like why are we using the guest to you shouldn't be on the guest it was on guest too that's uh, what was on this thing's been giving me problems all morning i don't it was re, it was resetting and everything did ours or the internet yeah which is oh, this machine there you're on okay i don't care about no, the big monitors because nobody Sydney, else is here yeah no sydney said about the same thing see and it says you're in the meeting okay but no, I, really, I don't know if these guys can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, you're okay, we're back. All right, cool. Yeah. I, 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 don't, I guess I just had to turn off the TV. I don't know. What a nightmare, guys. Sorry. Like Doing said, the best I can here. We're having a Monday here. Everyone <laughs> Just add it to our pop. We're all recovering them, though. I do not understand this stuff. I'm going to look for a better solution, I promise. Um. So, yeah, so... Again, regarding the uh, permitting thing, you know, if there's a, it's it's kind of, you know, I don't know, I don't think that's a fair, and certainly what I would say to a seller is, you know, you either got to assist or they're going to go away. Uh, the, a permit's only, a permit's going to need to be closed out to convey title. So whatever really happened, whatever anybody wants to do, they're going to have to do. But that spells out the, 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 the the terms and conditions that it's managed right um i think everybody understands the escrow agent thing just spells it out where they're making escrow um and how an escrow agent is is managed so it, it, you know i think the one line in here and i look at line 292 you know if a licensed real estate broker agent will comply with as amended in FREC rules to timely resolve escrow disputes through mediation, arbitration, interpleader, and escrow disbursement order. The, what you need to know is that escrow is really held by title today. Uh, real estate companies don't. Um, my own thing that I would say here is, and it's a pain in the tail, but if you see like, you know, if, you, if it's Alliance, you know them. If it's Star Title, you know them. I think it's that uh, Lori Mooch has one. If it's a known title company to you, I don't get too concerned about them holding escrow. If it's some newer title agency or podunk title agency, I would suggest you have your our title company hold escrow until such time as it closes. There's certainly some stuff going on out there uh, that you want to be aware of. And title companies have a different... Um, in the case of an escrow dispute, title companies have different uh, rules that they have to be, uh, how they dispute, how they disperse and handle escrow disputes. And to make it simple, they have a finite amount of time and then they are gonna hire an interpleader, which is nothing more than an attorney to arbitrate. And the money comes out of the escrow. That's where it comes out of. So it's very critical that you get a substantial escrow deposit as a buyer's agent and as a seller's agent, it's very critical that you demand a substantial escrow deposit. Um, it's it's how you keep everybody kind of in check. Um, and like what I the way I look at, at at these contracts is that a contract should spell out the terms and conditions, and it should give neither party an unfair advantage or disadvantage. Obviously, as a buyer's agent, you might be trying to get your, your uh, buyer an advantage, but as a seller's agent, it's your duty to protect the seller. So in my, in my mindset, as a buyer's agent, you want to tell the, the buyer what to expect. So again, it's more collaboration than confrontation. If they don't acquiesce, if they don't acquiesce to your recommendation, and then they get a uh, either they miss out on a deal because of a term or condition, like an escrow deposit, or uh, they get a uh, 
a counter offer that's asking for more. So again, the more of this that you could have a conversation with up front, the better off you're going to have in your negotiations and in the event that you miss a deal and or uh, if the seller picks a different offer and or if a seller happens to counter offer your offer. If a buyer understands this might happen up front, it's going to go a whole lot better when you call them. Uh, professor, profe I, I really wish that everybody would, would read this. Broker advises buyer and seller to verify property conditions, square footage, and other facts from representation made pursuant to the contract and consult appropriate professionals for legal, tax, environment, and other specialized advice concerning matters affecting the property and the transaction contemplated by this contract. Broker represents to buyer that broker does not reside on the property and that all representations, oral, written, or otherwise, by broker are based on the seller's representations or public records, not your opinion. Buyer agrees to rely solely on seller professional inspectors and government agencies for verification of property conditions, square footage, and facts that materially affect the value of the property and not on the representations, oral, written, or otherwise of broker. It's in bold for a reason. That's all I can say, <laughs> okay? Buyer and seller individually, uh, each individual indemnifies, hold harmless, and releases broker and broker's officers, directors, agents, and all levels suffered by or incurred by broker, broker's officers, directors, agents in connection with or arising from claims, demands, or causes of action instituted by the sire or seller based on inaccuracy of information, information provided by the parties or from public records, right? Or failure to perform contractual obligations. The broker's performance at indemnifying parties' requests are of task beyond the scope of services, as amended, including broker's referral recommendation or retention of a vendor, or on behalf of the indemnifying product party, products or services provided by any such vendor, or on behalf of indemnifying party, and expenses occurred by any such vendor. Buyer and seller each assume full responsibility. Plain in paragraph. Okay. It does not relieve the broker of statutory obligations under 475 as amended for purposes of the contract broker will be treated as party to the contract. So I, I really wish that everybody would take that to heart. You know, um, if, if a buyer uses your recommendation or a seller uses your, uh, your recommendation, Basically, by the terms and conditions of this, you are absolved from any um, and any liability, right? But here's what I will share with each and every one of you. The most critical part of that statement is a seller or a buyer can institute legal action against anybody on a whim. And unfortunately, attorneys in most cases will take their money and do it. The the uh, the danger for you is in the cost of defense of your actions. So that's where you got to be. That's where you got to be cautious. But I digress. I mean, number 14 just said this is between the buyer and the seller and we're indemnified. Now you can you could break that indemnification if you go outside. And I know it's happened to I think it happened to Eleanor, honestly, where you know, a uh, where a sellers kind of shared some data with her verbally. There was no uh, recording of it you know, electronically or in writing. She shared that, and they got amnesia to it. So now it's your word against their word. That's a tough one to overcome. So I think the the recommendation that I make is that you know anything that you are going to convey on behalf of the the parties, you get some kind of documentation, whether it be an email, a text message, or something, and you get it recorded in app files. That's where your indemnification lies in the ability to prove it, right? Um, 
Here's your default and dispute resolution. It's very simple. Buyer fails or neglects or refuses to perform buyer's obligation under the contract, including payment of the deposit. Seller may elect to recover and retain the deposit for the account of the sellers agreed upon and liquidated damages. Consideration for execution of this contract and full settlement of any claims whereupon buyer and seller shall be relieved of all further obligations. A seller at seller's option uh, at seller's option may proceed in equity to enforce seller's rights under the contract. The portion of the deposit, if any paid to the listing broker upon default by seller shall be equally split between listing broker and cooperating broker, provided however cooperating broker share shall not be greater than the full commission. If the seller defaults, um, the buyer will get his money back. We've been, but well, here's a buyer may elect to receive return of buyer's deposit without waiving any action for damages resulting from seller's breach. In other words, guys, they could sue each other till the cows come home. I mean, that's just the bottom line. If you breach the contract, you breach the contract. That's all it is, right? Uh, your dispute resolution, buyer and seller shall within 10 days after date conflicting demands for deposit are made to prompt resolve any such dispute failing which buyer seller shall persuade to such dispute to mediation under paragraph 16 they're going to start paying money um and then it spells out where the mediation comes in this is where i think the the, the rubber meets the road here in 17 attorneys fees and costs right parties will split equally any mediation fees that can get pricey um they pay their own attorney's fees you know in any litigation permitted by the contract, the prevailing party shall be entitled to recover non-prevailing parties, cost and fees. That can be expensive. And any buyer or seller that starts pounding their fist down about what they're not going to do because they don't like it, they should clearly be pointed to item 17. Because that's where, again, neither party has an unfair advantage or disadvantage and everybody has to act accordingly per what they've agreed to, right? Um, the rest of this gets pretty cut and dry. I think they're the most important stuff. You know, these are definitions um, that I think are, I think critical for a buyer or a seller to read, you know? Um, and here's some things about title in here, like we talked about. You know, buyer shall five days after receipt of title commitment to examine, notify seller in writing any specific defects that render the title unmarketable. In other words, just because they see something on the title report, if the title company is willing to convey that title, conversation over. Conversation over. If they can't, the seller has 30 days to cure the problem which I would think they would want to do. So, you know, again, why would there be urgency in getting a title? And I got to go correct myself. There's the remedy. Um, there's the remedy if there's a problem. There's not a remedy on the time frame, but there's a remedy if there's a problem, right? And again, I think we just had one recently and I can't remember who it was, um, that there was a situation where a buyer's attorney didn't like something on the title report was the demanding it be get remedied, but the title company was saying, hey, we're gonna close that deal. We can write an exception on this. It's not a problem. Well, if it's a marketable title, it's a marketable title. You know, you could ask for anything you want, but if the title company's willing to close and they're willing to, to uh, issue title insurance, then there's not much more anybody can do. I mean, in that case. Um, Everything else, liens got to be cleared. Uh, the, the other thing here, like these are your definitions. So when you've gone over this stuff in the contract or the buyer reads it, they understand what it is. I love this, the, the time one, calendar days shall be used in computing time periods, not, uh, not uh, business days. Time is the essence other than time of acceptance and effective date, any time periods provided for or dates specified in a contra contract uh, end or occur on a Saturday or Sunday or national legal holiday, extend to 5 p.m. of the next business day. So that's where, you know, if it falls on, if the time frame expires on the weekend, it, it or let me say this, normal, normal expiration time is midnight, the day of the expiration date. If it falls on a weekend or a legal holiday, 
it's 5 p.m. It's just 5 p.m. of the next business day. So if it ends on a Sunday, five o'clock Monday, the inspect that that period's over. Um, everything else is, I think, is pretty etched in stone here. Uh, it's pretty interesting location. Closing will be conducted by the attorney or closing agent designated by the party for the owner's title insurance and will take place in the county where the real property is located. That's often overlooked and people can agree to do something else, but happened again. Yeah. Oh man.
Can you hear anything, Lane? Can you hear me? Ah, now I can. All right. I'm just going back to, I'm just picking up a, another contract and hopefully, of course I picked a new build, I'm an idiot. We were almost done. So I, okay. I what I was saying is I certainly do apologize for the technology glitches. I got to find a better way to do this. No worries. Zoom is just glitching. Why, like, uh, it is why. I... Here we go. Okay. So, uh, going back to what we're saying about access to property, seller shall, upon reasonable notice, provide utility service and access to property for appraisal. It, we, we had a little bit of a bone of contention with this. Um, over what an attorney said. And, and he, here's what I've been explaining to our corporate attorney as it pertains to this, okay? You cannot just, you cannot extract one portion of a contract and try and use it to your advantage on either side of the equation, right? So access, to, this is very clear. If you read, if you just read the bold statements, it tells you what it's about, right? Access to property to conduct appraisals, inspections, and walkthroughs. Seller shall upon reasonable notice provide utility service and access to property for appraisals and inspections, including a walkthrough prior to closing. That it's very specific and that is designed to protect the private, the way it's been explained to me, it's very specific to, to protect the uh, privacy of a home seller that, you know, they're going to make the property as uh, accessible as possible, but once it's under contract, you, you know, there are limitations on rights to both parties and what's to be done. So, you know, that's why there's specific dates and times in there for, uh, for inspections and what their purposes are. You know, anybody can agree to anything um, that is true. I'm not here to say that they can't. What I wholly, wholly, wholly recommend to everybody is that regardless of what side of the equation you're on, to always think as if you were representing the other party and what you may advise them to be cautious of. I've, I've always prided myself on the ability to do that, to look at it, to look at it and see you know, okay, my buyer's asking for this, but if I was representing the seller, what would I say? And again, you always have to kind of go to the danger spot, like what the danger spot is. I mean, that it's it's a nightmare, but it's true. Um, the rest of this is pretty, uh, contract's not recordable, so it's not, you know, it's a binding agreement, but they're gonna, they're, the deed gets recorded the uh, note gets recorded, the mortgage gets recorded, the title is not a re recorded document. Um, every, you know, contract contains a full and complete understanding and agreement of the buyer and the seller, very important. Uh, waiver, failure of a buyer or seller to insist on compliance with or strict performance of any provisions of this contract or to take advantage of any right under this contract shall not constitute a waiver of pro other provisions in the contract, but your actions could waive. Like, so in other words, if you waive your finance contingency, it doesn't waive your other rights in the contract, right? So the contract is, a, is each paragraph is its own thing. Um, everything else, guys, I don't think there's a really need to go over um, to go over independently. Um, the only other thing I would really stress in my opinion is obviously if there are, you must check, right? Uh, you know, if there's an addendum that you're using, you wanna check box the addendum. If there's other, you wanna note what it is, additional terms and conditions in here. I also highly recommend and I know they don't say to do it at the board. I understand it, but I also highly recommend 
whatever, you know, like if you're a sales agent, you write in what your brokerage fee is that they're agreeing to in the MLS. And as a sales, as a listing associate, write in per listing agreement for commission. Uh, I, it's, it's not, there's not a line on there, but I have to tell you, you know, I mean, it's, it's up here, you know, listing co-op brokers are the only brokers that are entitled to compensation in connection with the contract instruction, the closing agent, seller and buyer direct closing agent to disperse the closing, the full amount of the brokerage fee as specified in the separate brokerage agreements with the parties and co-op agreements between the brokers, except to the extent broker has retained such fees from the escrowed funds. The contract shall not modify any MLS or other compensation made by the seller listing agreement. So this, I mean, it's, you're not going to be able to use it to go to court, but I think it does, it does alleviate any, and you don't have to do this. This is just my recommendation. It does alleviate any disputes after the fact um, of anything that, uh, you know, because you as a buyer's agent, you don't see what the listing agents agreed to. And, you know, nothing for nothing, they can go in and amend, they can go in and amend the, uh, the listing agreement. I mean, the MLS after closing. So, you, you know, I think it's really important that you protect yourself in some way. The other thing I think that's really important is that you obtain a copy of your closing disclosure uh, and or your um, Alta settlement statement so that you can clearly see what they are compensating and that your fees are correct on there ahead of time. Don't wait till closing to see it. Um, so with that, I mean, that's really as in-depth as I can be, I believe. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, shout them out now if you don't mind. So where would you suggest putting the fees? Like I put it right here. Cooperating sales associate, uh, you know, Tony John Cola, cooperating broker, Remax Elite Realty, 3% minus 350. Okay. Listing sales associate, uh, uh, Dustin Layton, listing broker, Remax Elite Realty per listing agreement. Hmm. Okay. That's the way I did it. Again, I know unequivocally that I'm going against the grain and that's not what they tell you down at the board and clearly it's not what it says right there. But I think it does at least establish something to go back to uh, that you don't have. It, 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 it probably happens two to three times a year where you know something goes haywire and it usually gets rec reconciled, but Anything I could do to be in front of a problem, I like to be in front of a problem personally. That's just me. Sure. Thanks. Anybody else? A again, I, I, then I, I'll close it up just by saying this. Look, I think that it's really important that you have an understanding of the contract that you pick out the parts that I think, you know, that you think are important. I happen to think creating urgency by using the contract to create urgency is a great um, a tool that you can use to your advantage. I think that clearly, if you open your mind up to some of the things we talked about regarding uh, inspections and regarding title, regarding uh, financing, that you will clearly see and understand that that the price isn't there's a couple things that are equally as important as price in a contract and why um and they're different for both the buyer and the seller right so it, it's just important that you have an understanding and you create a strategy for you on how you're going to use the uh the contract to your advantage and to the advantage of your client and or the protection of your client, right? Um, that's really what you're trying to do in an advisory role. Uh, I know you've heard me say it, we're not parties to the contract. I think too often than not, agents in their, in their kind of zeal to advise, try to instill their will 
And I think there's a fine line between that. But the advice comes, and when you have a real clear understanding of the contract, I think it becomes easier to, to separate that line and really be high quality in a high quality advisory role for your client. Um, that's just my humble opinion. Um, and, and, you know, you look at it by, by understanding this document and how to use it effectively and explain it effectively. Um, you do become a business professional, a salesperson that sells real estate for a living, right? And being a realtor becomes the organization that, you, you know, the group that you have to be a part of to get some of the tools that you need. Um, you know, so many realtors and I mean this not in a disrespectful way, but in where the business can improve. So many realtors think that being a realtor is all about showing property. And it's really about being a good quality advisor and understanding the dynamics of the scope of probably the single biggest transaction that any human being is going to be a part of for the most part. You know, sure, you might run into somebody that's a professional athlete. Sure, you might run into somebody that's a that's a business person that's going to buy a building or something like that or buy a business. Sure, some people might buy a big dollar boat, I suppose. Um, but I think in general terms, this is a single biggest transaction somebody's going to be a part of. So you want to help them navigate it without frightening them, advise them to both sides of the transaction. Because I, I look at, I know that I could be perceived as confrontational, right? But the fact of the matter is, when I'm working with somebody, it's collaborating and really drilling home points so that the parties don't become confrontational. That's my goal. You, you, you net, you're always going to reflect back on whenever you have a conversation with somebody, you are going to reflect back on, or you should be reflecting back on nothing but the contract. It's not about feelings. It's not about emotions, right? First phase of the real estate transaction, selection and or marketing. That's emotional. That's all emotional. I like it. I love it. I've lived here. Johnny grew up here. That first phase is emotion. Once you transition into the contract and negotiation phase, and then once it's effective into the administration phase, there's no more emotion. And the sooner you can master that art, that once it gets effective, you're becoming a facilitator of a legal document and you keep your emotion out of it, if you've allowed it in there, you're going to have a much more collaborative nature because like when I look at a contract, there's nothing to get mad about. We both agreed to terms and conditions. And I'm saying we, when I'm saying buyer and seller, buyer and seller has agreed to terms and conditions. And once everybody has signed it, once all initials are made and that becomes effective, there are no more conversations about terms and conditions unless everybody wants to agree. And if one, and I think it's really important for you because you could be with a buyer, you could be with a seller. If somebody on one side or the other is trying to change something and the other person doesn't want to change that, don't make them out to be evil, even if it's even if it's what you perceive to be reasonable. Right? Even if it's simple, even if it's reasonable, even if it's easy. Don't demonize the other side if they don't want to do it. Or talk about the other side in a negative way because they don't want to do it because it's their right to make their own decision as well because you're managing a contract. You're not managing feelings. So I, the reason I bring that up is because I hear it so often after an effective contract where the parties go at each other, right? It's, it's crazy how much animosity gets built into a transaction. 
after it's effective. And most of it, from my experience, is because agents bring their personal feelings between them and the other agent or share information with a buyer or a seller that doesn't necessarily, about feelings. Oh, the seller said this. Oh, the seller feels that. Oh, the seller wants, it, you know, just man, like I just go to, look, we're just managing a con I think you've all heard me say that, right? I'm just managing a contract at this point. How they feel, how they think, what they want. I don't care. I can't get into that. Anything beyond what's in this contract, we need an addendum to, and everybody's got to sign it. So I think if you look at it from that standpoint, not that the business becomes easier, it just becomes a little clearer, I think. For me, that it, 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 I share with you how I feel about it. You may feel differently. I respect that. I'm not suggesting that you should do it my way. I'm just suggesting what has worked for me over the years. And you take some of that, all of that, none of that, and mitigate it, it you know, kind of merge it into where you want to be as a provider, as an advisor, and you go from there. But the only thing that I would say is a must is understand that once you have an effective contract, you have an effective contract. That's it. That's the terms and conditions are black and white. And then you can go from there. Um, with that, I'll close it up. If anybody's got anything, be more than happy to discuss it or go on from there. Anybody? Nope. Thank you very much. Guys, I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, best of luck to everybody. I think May is going to be a great month. Uh, please reach out if you need help with anything. If there's anything I talked about here that um, creates a question mark or a concern for you uh, down the line, you want to talk about how to use it in a specific situation, please don't hesitate to just shoot me a text or whatever, and, I, and I'll reach right back out to you. Uh, really, listen, all kidding aside, I think it's brilliant that and I'm not being critical of those who couldn't be in, they could be in an appointment, whatever. I think it's brilliant to take time to get to just, even if you don't agree with me, to hear my perspective on this document, um, and then you use it. You can only become better for it. I, I always pride myself, so I really do, uh, without being corny, uh, I really do congratulate you three for doing it, not for listening to me, but for listening to someone. Um, and I really do commend you for it. I mean, it, it just shows you're committed to your profession and to your clients. So I, I, that, that, that's, that's really special and you should really be proud of yourselves for doing that. So have a great day. Thank you again and uh, reach out if you need me, okay? Thank Thanks, you. Tony. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.